Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this panel about Earth planetary defense, the last panel of this uh, European Space Generation Workshop. Why a panel about Earth planetary defense? Uh, well, the risk of having asteroids or comets impacting the Earth is low, but the consequences of such a scenario could be catastrophic for all of us. Today in this panel, we would like to understand which is our level of defense. Uh, as humans, what can we do? Are we able to discover new Earth objects? Can we monitor them? Uh, do we have the capability to deflect them? In order to answer all those questions, we have invited today four experts representing different entities of the European space sector. So let's uh, introduce them. First speaker will be Juan Luis Cano, uh, Information System Coordinator at ISA at the NEO Coordination Center in Estrin, Italy. Uh, welcome, Juan Luis. Hello, good morning. Second speaker will be Michael Cooper, Planetary Scientist at ISA, the European Space Astronomy Center in Madrid. Welcome, Michael. Good morning. Good morning. Third speaker will be Mehdi Escubo, a Space System Engineer at GOM Space. Hi, Mehdi. Good morning, Mehdi. everyone. Good morning. And last but not least, we will count on the presence of Mariela Graziano, Executive Director in Strategy and Business Development of Flight Systems and Robotics at GMV. Hi, Mariela. Hi, good morning or good evening, whatever you are. <laughs> <laughs> and just to finish the introduction, we will have now a presentation given by each speaker of uh, 10 minutes, more or less, and we will end with a Q&A session as usual. Uh, so please, I encourage you to use the Q&A tab uh, available in Hopin, and the speakers will try to answer all your questions at the end. So Juan Luis, uh, whenever you want to start, the screen is all yours. Thanks a lot, Ivan. Uh, good morning, or hello uh, to everyone again. I will start by speaking of the threat. Uh, we will be seeing from the rest of colleagues uh, today other aspects of planetary defense, but uh, my role here will, will be to present a bit on the, on the asteroid threat itself. And uh, this is, uh, I think it, there is a paramount example of this threat, and this is uh, given here, you might uh, recall this event that occurred in uh, uh, February, the 15th of February 2013, which is the entry of a 20 meter asteroid uh, above the city of Chelyabinsk in Russia, um, and uh, which provoked um, a big, a big uh, outburst in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the sky in, the, in this morning uh, over the city, and actually uh, produced uh, something like 1,600 um, injured people. Uh, fortunately, there were no casualties, but uh, it was an impacting event, and it raised, raised, uh, uh, ringed the bells on uh, on the fact that we are exposed to this uh, to these risks from the asteroids. And asteroids, uh, as you might know, are the leftovers of the of the creation of the solar system, and uh, to our to our help, they concentrate mostly in the uh, uh, in orbits which are between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, as you can see here, this is the orbit of Mars, uh, and the orbit of Jupiter is the big circle here. But uh, some of those points actually come into the inner part of the solar system and actually uh, cross the orbit of the Earth and even the orbits of, of uh, the orbit of Venus. So those are the ones that are actually supposing a risk for us, and these are the ones that we are uh, looking after. How do we do that? We do that by means of two main um, observational practices. The first one is actually the one that allows us to discover them. Uh, there are lots of these bodies in the solar system and we need to discover them first. And at this point, the most of these efforts have been carried out in the US uh, by uh, NASA funded uh, surveys, as for example, this one that you have here, the Pan-STARRS survey uh, telescopes and the Catalina Sky Survey. And um, they have been quite successful in finding uh, lots of asteroids. ESA is going to contribute to this by the development of the fly -Eye telescope that is uh, currently under, uh, under a construction and it will be placed, the first of them will be placed in the, east, the island of Sicily in, in a couple of years. And it will allow to, uh, that, that also Europe uh, uh, co um, collaborates in the, in the uh, discovery of but not only that, there is also the need to, once those, those objects have been discovered, 
to actually follow them up because the more the more uh, measurements you collect from an asteroid, the better you will know the, its orbit in a space, and uh, uh, furthermore, uh, you the easier will be to propagate the, the the orbits and see what says the the uh, the space that they occupy in the in the future and hopefully find whether they suppose effect for the Earth or not. In that respect, um, the work that we do here at ESA uh, is actually do, um, to follow up many of the, those ob objects, and in particular those that actually are uh, uh, seen to pose a uh, possible risk to, to the Earth. How do we do that? Well, actually, the first thing is that we need to observe them, and uh, as uh, the, the trick to, to actually locate them is the fact that they are and, and you can see, for example, here a couple of examples. You see a, a background starfield here, which is uh, uh, has been observed by a given telescope. And what we do is to take several images of the sky at different moments. And if there is anything that is moving there, uh, we can claim that to be an asteroid or or a, a comet. Of course, if if they, if they have very long, very high velocities, maybe they are satellites that are orbiting the Earth. But we we have we we have tools. And we have means in order to distinguish between satellites and Earth satellites and uh, asteroids and comets. Um, so this is, uh, let's say, the way that we use to discover them and also to track them. Because, uh, as I said before, there is uh, also the need to follow up them, such that uh, that we can uh, gather as as many measurements as possible in order to improve the knowledge of their. Uh, um, just uh, it's this is a this is a very interesting plot. It's a complicated one. I don't want to get into into a lot of detail here. But what I want to tell you with this plot is uh, that is uh, in logarithmic uh, scales is the fact that the the population of objects in the solar system uh, follows um, an exponential law. So if uh, you have here, for example, the size of the of a given object. And you can see quickly that uh, for objects that are uh, crossing the orbit of the Earth and are uh, above 10 kilometers in size, there are just a few. If we take the ones that are uh, in one kilometer size, we would see that there are uh, there are almost a thousand objects. If we go one order of magnitude less in size, so 100 meters, quickly you see that this rises uh, in exponential terms. So we rise now to something like 20, 30,000 objects, and so forth. So uh, this tells us that the, there is a clear, clear law um, explaining uh, the, the numbers of objects in the solar system, and uh, which is provided by this curve here. Uh, there is this blue line here that tells us it's, it's an approximation to this exponential law, and the uh, this um, uh, this curve here tells us the one below tells us what is the the, the number of objects that we have already discovered. Uh, okay, this curve is a little, a little bit update, um, out, of date, out of date, but um, we are not. not uh, we are, uh, let's say, a little bit up uh, with respect to this curve. So this triangle here up is the is what what is left to be discovered, and this is what we, we are uh, where we are concentrating all our efforts in order to to try to find the uh, the millions uh, the millions of objects that are still to be found. So far, we have found uh, uh, 20, uh, 26,000 objects, of which uh, nearly uh, 900 are over one kilometer. And here we have a high level of completion of the of the expected population. Uh, and the ones that are uh, above 140 meters are around, uh, we have discovered around uh, 10,000, and there are roughly 25,000. And um, and this means that, uh, that we have a still a long, a long way to go asteroid that we have not yet seen. Um, how do we do that, that work? Well, the, the first thing is to do the orbit determination. So once we have re, um, received those measurements that are sent by all the observatories in the world that are observing asteroids to the Manor Plant Center in US, we gather all those, those measurements in order to determine by mathematical methods a given orbit. Of course, this allows us later to project this data in the future and actually tell where it will be with a given uncertainty because the measurements are not perfect. Um, and then later we can, by doing this follow-up, we can uh, take an observatory and, and, and try to ascertain whether we will be uh, able to locate it at the expected location. 
and we will be locating it in this area of, of, of uncertainty. With that in mind, we are able then to uh, update the, uh, the trajectory and have a much better and, and by better constraint orbit for the, for the asteroids. Then we're using that later for the second step, uh, important step, which, which is the impact monitoring. The impact monitoring allows us to, once we have, uh, for example, here the sun, the earth, and, and an asteroid, we have a, a trajectory of this asteroid and maybe it passes close to the earth. And if we project that area of uncertainty that we were speaking, yeah, that I was speaking about before into the future, and we typically do, do, do that for a hundred years in the future, we're able to see whether there is any chances that the object might impact the earth. And this is what we do in order to compute what we call the impact probability and actually to characterize an asteroid as a possible uh, impactor. We actually publish all that information in our web portal, and this is uh, this is uh, the web portal. <coughs> I invite you to visit us at this at this address, and we are providing lots of services there. But in particular, the, the let's say the most relevant we believe is the one that allows us to provide the, the relevant risk uh, for the different asteroids. So we have now roughly a thousand and two hundred objects in this list out of the 26,000 that I was mentioning before. And there you will see that they are all categorized by their risk by means of what we call the Palermo scale or the Torino scale. I will not delve into that because the, the, the discussion would extend a lot and uh, we have a limited time today, but I invite you to, to visit our web portal and uh, get acquainted with all, these, with all these numbers. But it's important that you remind that we are tracking at ESA and also at NASA the risk posed by asteroids, and we have, and that we have dedicated lists for uh, their uh, for their risk for the evolution of their risk. Um, and with that, uh, well, I thank you a lot, and, and I hope that I've been able to transmit to you a bit on the on the threat actually supposed by the by the uh, near Earth asteroids. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juan Luis. Um, interesting to know that there's still a triangle there that remains to be discovered. Uh, I guess, delegates, we will have questions about your presentation. Please use the Q&A uh, tab and we will address your questions at the end. Now, uh, let's move to the next uh, presentation that will be given by uh, Michael Kuipers. Um, Michael, whenever you want to start, uh, I share your screen. Yeah, okay, we are okay. You can start whenever you want. Okay. Now, after the discovery and following the asteroids, then the next kind of obvious question is, if we find an asteroid that is on collision course with Earth, is there something we can do about it? And I can already say we, we may live in a kind of special time in that we are the first generation where we think that the answer to this question is yes. I'll start with a little bit with a description of the three uh, methods that are currently under discussion for asteroid deflection, should it be necessary uh, one day. And essentially the principle always is to exert some force on the asteroid that changes its trajectory so that instead of colliding with us, it will miss us. Of course, this action would have to occur much earlier than in the, in the sketch that is indicated here. The first method is what's called the gravity factor. The, the principle is very simple. One puts the spacecraft with a mass as large as possible next to the asteroid, and then the gravity of the spacecraft will attract the asteroid and will slowly change its orbit. And if this is done early enough, it, may, it, it can avoid that the asteroid collides with Earth. So the advantage is it's conceptual, very simple, except for the mass, it does not depend on the, on the properties of the asteroid. And well, the main disadvantage is it's quite inefficient in the sense that all realistic, in all realistic cases, the spacecraft mass will be much lower than the asteroid mass. So it takes a lot of time. So this will only work if the asteroid is relatively small and there is a, is a warning time ideally of, of decades. The 
Second option is a bit on the other end of the extreme, which is a nuclear explosion, which doesn't necessarily mean that one would blast the asteroid in, in pieces. Normally, the idea is a standoff explosion, where the, 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 the explosion wave would push the asteroid inside. Still, this is highly efficient. This is, would be the only option for, for really big objects. There's a disadvantage is that, the, that there is less control and of course, any launching any big nuclear device or nuclear devices in such a case will always be controversial. The third method is what we call kinetic impactor. Here the video is where something similar was already done for this uh, um, deep impact mission, which hit Comet Temple One. Also, this was for purely scientific reason, not for planetary defense. So the idea is so that for the spacecraft itself to impact the asteroid, and then the momentum of the spacecraft is transferred to the asteroid, which will change its, its velocity, which will change its course. And this can also ensure that the asteroid uh, does not hit Earth. Here, a certain complication is that in addition to the momentum transfer, there may be an additional effect from the reaction force of the ejector that comes out of the crater when the spacecraft hits. And this, is, this effect is difficult to, to predict and depends a lot on the properties of the asteroid that is threatening Earth. As a summary, of the three, of the three methods, this plot shows the a uh, method that would work as a function of the size of the asteroid and the, and the warning time. So for a, anything that's um, that's smaller than 50 or 100 meters or so, one would not go for a deflection mission. It would probably also not be feasible, firstly, because most of those asteroids would be detected relatively late and also they would be difficult to, to, to rendezvous or to hit for those, those missions. So depending on the size, it would be just uh, either staying away from windows, which would be, have been a good idea for the Chalia in uh, explosion that Juan Luis showed, or evacuation of regions and so on. Um, for the somewhat larger ones, the method of choice would be the kinetic impactor, or for very large warning times, it could be the, the gravity tractor, and the really big ones, there would be the only choice uh, nuclear explosion. Now, as we have seen in the previous presentation, there are many more smaller asteroids and bigger ones. So the, the method that would be most likely uh, to, be, to, to be used in the real case is the kinetic impactor. And actually the first technology demonstration mission for the, for the kinetic impactor is right now under development. So this is uh, the International Asteroid Impact Deflection Assessment or AIDA collaboration. And it consists of first part, actually later this year or early next year, NASA start mission will be launched, which is a sandwich is the impactor. And it will go to a binary asteroid, to an asteroid with a moon, the asteroid is called Didymos, is around 800 meters in size, and it has a moon which is 160, 170 meters. It's exactly so, this 100 to 200 range, which is the most likely case uh, for, the, for, the, for the real impact. And for the technology demonstration, it will not change the heliocentric orbit of the asteroid, but it will change the orbit of the moon around the, the primary asteroid. So it will be launched uh, later this later this year, and is expected to impact on Dimorphos, that's the name of the moon, end of September, early October next year. So it's really in the in the very near near future. And then, as I mentioned before, to really understand the kinetic impact, it's also important to collect information both about the asteroid and about the um, and about what happened with the, with the impact, because we want to understand this 
enhancement effect due to the ejector that come out of the crater and that can enhance the effect of the kinetic impact. And to achieve this, a couple of years later, ESA's HERA mission will be launched in 2024 and arrive at Didymos uh, end, end of 26, early 27. There the goals are to measure actually the mass of the secondary, which is important to understand or to, to measure the, the efficiency of the of the transfer of the momentum of the impacting spacecraft, while the velocity change of, of the moon can be measured actually from the ground as those asteroids is an eclipsing binary and the pe orbital period can be very accurately before, determined before and after, after from the eclipse timing. The other objectives are really to understand and to measure the properties of the moon to be able to scale the outcome of the experiment to the real case. And then another objective is to look at the crater as detailed as possible because those missions also give us a unique opportunity to have a crater from an impact where the um, where the, the impact or properties are accurately known. We have many uh, impact craters on asteroids or the moon and so on, but generally we don't know exactly what has impacted there and we have many more free parameters. And so having an impact, a crater from an impact where the impactor and its velocity are accurately known will help us also to understand the cratering process, which again also help, would help us to prepare such a deflection in the future. So even if an asteroid is going to hit, there is hope that we could avoid it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, uh, for that presentation and the different methods that we have to, to deflect the uh, asteroid. Um, we will address uh, questions for these presentations after all the, the the speaker's presentations. Let's move now to the next uh, speaker, Mehdi Escubo. Uh, hi, Mehdi. Hello. Mm. You can start whenever you want. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I will start with uh, this funny picture you can see now uh, on the screen. Um, so indeed, while the dinosaurs couldn't uh, do that, so they couldn't uh, press a button to stop uh, an asteroid, um, we actually live in a very exciting time where we think we might be able to do just that. Uh, we might be able to um, prevent uh, an asteroid from, from damaging the, the, the Earth and our population. So of course, it's a bit more complicated than that. It's not about just uh, pressing a button. Um, we have seen from the presentation uh, before from uh, Juan Luis and from Michael that um, there, are, there are a lot of different uh, uh, steps we need to take, um, uh, skills we need to, uh, to have as a, as a species. And, and for that, we need to, uh, to, to learn more and, and to train more. Um, so if we if we um, um, narrow down planetary defense to uh, to five big tasks, let's say um, we already saw see about the um, finding and tracking an asteroid. Um, we already saw about the deflection, um, but there is also the, the coordination, uh, which is basically coordinating between the different um, uh, agencies, organization, institutions uh, around the world, so that we uh, we work together towards this uh, this effort. And then there is also the characterization. Uh, we need to be able to characterize uh, more asteroids to understand better how they are uh, composed and the, the diversity in, the, in compositions that they are um, so that we improve our model of deflection so that when we actually um, get to deflect one that we uh, actually uh, can predict what will happen uh, with such a deflection. So I will, um, I will focus on the, on the characterizing part of things and uh, to characterize asteroids we need space missions. Of course, we can learn a lot from ground uh, with observation, uh, radar, uh, telescopes, um, but we also need to go out there and uh, even bring back samples uh, when we can. Um, so this is really where personally I get my inspiration from uh, because I'm always impressed and amazed that we actually managed to do this. Uh, actually, uh, every day I'm a bit more amazed that this is even possible uh, when working on technical challenges such as this. Indeed, uh, space missions are an incredible uh, technical and human challenge. Um, and uh, while we do that, we uh, maybe improve our, our skills towards uh, planetary defense. Uh, but we also learn a lot uh, about uh, compositions of, uh, of asteroids. We learn about our solar system 
And we also develop technologies that can be used in other parts of the space sector. So you can see here uh, in the GIF uh, an example from uh, the osiris rex mission from NASA that brought, uh, that went to the, uh, the Bennu asteroids and um, touched down to, uh, to uh, bring some, some samples. Uh, so uh, exciting to, uh, to see what these samples will uh, teach us. And then, of course, uh, Europe is also uh, exploring. Um, here you can see uh, the, the gift from the, from the Rosetta mission. Um, those are incredibly challenging but rewarding missions where we learn really a lot. And uh, OK, even when we don't have uh, samples uh, brought back to Earth, um, in this case for Rosetta, we had, a, we had a lander. And there are a lot of lessons learned from that that we keep building on every day. In this case, of course, it was a it was a comet. But in the end, the technologies that we develop in terms of uh, of uh, spacecraft uh, spacecraft subsystems and also uh, uh, scientific payloads on board the spacecraft, uh, these technologies are the same. So what we learned there, we could learn also and use for for asteroids. So um, the two missions that I mentioned before were about characterizing, and there are many more. Uh, we had also the, the Ayabusa mission from uh, from the our Japanese colleague at JAXA, and uh, many more missions are are currently uh, in planning. And then I want to briefly go back on the uh, on the kinetic Im uh, impactor um, that uh, Michel described to you just before, so the asteroid impact and deflection assessment. So you can see here the, the the dart part of the mission, which is uh, led by NASA. But I want to point you to this uh, small object that is behind a uh, dart on the image, uh, which is actually a, a CubeSat um, that is being uh, designed and and built by uh, Argotech in Italy. So it's a European CubeSat. Uh, coordinated by the Italian Space Agency, that will help us to uh, also uh, take some images before and uh, and right after the impact. Um, so it's also uh, uh, useful because uh, the that will be destroyed at the impact, and so it's interesting to have something that will uh, be able to take some some uh, hopefully uh, nice images of that. Then, if we go back to the to the European contribution, so the Hera mission. Um, that was described by uh, by Michel before. So again, you can see in the background uh, Didymos, so the bigger asteroid, and then in the in the foreground you can see uh, Dimorphos, which is the moon, where you can see the uh, the, the the place of the impact, um, and then you see uh, Hera, the Hera motorcraft, but you also see two other small uh, satellites in there, uh, which are also CubeSat. Um, so indeed, uh, the Hera motorcraft is the main uh, mission that will have a lot of uh, of. Uh, scientific uh, um, uh, experiments uh, on board and a lot of uh, science goals. But we also have uh, two CubeSats uh, that will be traveling with Hira, which are uh, opportunity payloads. Um, so the cruise will happen in the motorcraft until we arrive at the asteroid, um, a cruise over roughly two years. And once we are at the asteroid, uh, the Hira motorcraft will release the two CubeSats. And uh, these two CubeSats will have the, the opportunity to contribute to the science of the Hira mission. So if you look at this uh, this image here, which is uh, from a recently released cartoon by Isa, uh, I encourage you to uh, to check the video on YouTube. It's uh, it's very informative and uh, and very funny. Uh, you can see in the middle again the the dinosaur uh, that I had on my first slide. So indeed, uh, with the Hira motorcraft on the left, you see uh, uh, Milani, one of the two cubesats, which will have a hyperspectral uh, imager um, to image the the, the surface and uh, and uh, to understand better the the rocks of the asteroid. And then on the right side, Juventus, the other CubeSat, uh, which will bring on board a, a radar payload um, to, uh, to, to image also the, the, the asteroid, but also understand the, uh, the composition by looking at the interior structure. So Milani and Juventus are really small CubeSat, um, six units in the CubeSat world, one unit being uh, 10 by 10 centimeter. So in the end, it's basically a, a shoebox of uh, 30 by 20 by 10 centimeter. But they will carry on board ambitious payloads, uh, scientific payloads, that could help achieve the mission goals um, and really help the scientists gathering more data uh, once we are um, at the asteroid system. So if I focus, oh, I skipped one. Uh, if I focus a bit more on the on the Juventus um, um, CubeSat, which I'm currently working on at uh, GOM Space Luxembourg, um, you can see uh, the, the the CubeSat fully deployed here with the solar panels for generating power. And you can see also uh, four beer, big uh, poles. Um, these are the antennas of uh, the radar. So Juventus will be carrying a radar payload um, to uh, image the interior, as I mentioned before, using these four big antennas, which are 1.5 meter long each. 
We will also have an uh, inter-satellite link, which is a uh, radio frequency uh, communication between the CubeSat and the monocraft. And this will help us to uh, also uh, do some, uh, some radio science in order to better understand the, the mass properties um, of, of the, the asteroid system. And finally, at the end of the mission, uh, we will try to land on uh, Dimorphos, uh, which is the body you can see here on the image. Um, and we carry a payload, which is a gravimeter, uh, which uh, hopefully will help us um, gather more data about the mass properties and also the gravitational properties um, of, the, uh, of the asteroid system. And this will really help us to, to learn more about this, uh, the asteroid system, but also to improve our models and better understand what we have exactly done with this uh, deflection experience. So finally, I want to say that uh, Europe is, uh, is clearly uh, leading the way in terms of uh, deep space and asteroid exploration, uh, also with CubeSats. Um, so we are helping to, to mature and really prepare uh, planetary defense concepts uh, with these uh, missions. And the next few years will bring a lot of, 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 of interesting uh, CubeSats. Uh, so there will be Licia cubes with DART, uh, I mentioned before. It will be Juventus and Milani with uh, Hera. And uh, also others like, for example, uh, Emargo that you can see here on the slide, uh, which is a mission that uh, GOMSpace also uh, worked on and uh, we look forward to, uh, to work more in the future on. So basically we are building technologies and experience uh, to do these missions. And the potential in CubeSat mission is actually quite uh, big. If you think about the cost, um, what we're trying to achieve here is to reduce by one order of magnitude the cost of, of, of space missions. If we can show that uh, instead of having hundreds of millions of euros for uh, a space mission, that we can also do amazing science with um, one order of magnitude less, so tens of, of millions of euros, uh, that would be a great achievement for, for the sector. We could also be faster because uh, we, are, we are smaller spacecraft and we can afford to take more risk because it's cheaper. Um, so we could be uh, faster in, in, uh, in building and then launching and then connecting the mission. And then of course, if we are cheaper and faster, we could also have more of this mission, which is very interesting for the, for the space sector overall, for the deep space exploration, but also for planetary defense, because we need to characterize more objects to understand what they are, comp they are being composed of and to, to know more how we can deflect them. So that's it for me, thank you. Thank you very much, Mehdi. Um, let's now move to the last um, presentation before uh, the Q&A session. Uh, hi, Mariela. I'm gonna share your screen as well. Yeah, so Mariela, whenever you want to start, the screen is all yours. Okay, so good morning again. Uh, I mean, being the last one after three nice presentations, it's always difficult then to add something new, but I'll try because as, as, as you, I think you got already the flower that we are re really living an exciting moment, that moment worldwide, but in Europe, because it's, Europe is really leading the planetary defense action that is currently on place. Uh, let's see if I... Okay, uh, you have seen already those 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 slides, so I will not uh, I will not really go in in them. Just to maybe something that is very important um, is that uh, as copying what my ISA colleagues always say, uh, especially the, the let's say what the, the guy that I call the father of Vera, uh, the current project manager of uh, of, of the mission. Uh, DART and ERA are, uh, can be considered like first, a mission first, in, in the sense that um, they will be the first mission to, to, to study, to fly uh, towards a binary asteroid, very complex uh, space system. Um, ERA and DART will, will study the smaller asteroid ever, very, very small, the Didymos uh, moon the dimorphos is very, very small, 160 meters only. We will be uh, validating the kinetic impactor uh, as already stressed by, by Michael. Uh, we will be the, 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 the mission. Uh, I, I say we because we are working and until we are, we are all feeling the, <laughs> the challenge of those, mis, uh, those missions. We will be the first uh, full-scale cratering physics assessment, very, very important for for science, very, very important for planetary 
uh, defense, and also will be first in the radar tomography of an asteroid. Something also very important uh, is that uh, the way this has been done, and Michael already said something on this, but uh, ESA and NASA are now uh, working together in a different way because uh, DART and, 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 and ERA, they are, they say, independent mission. They have a value themselves uh, by, by design, if you allow me an engineeristic, engineeristic term. But the, the two missions to, together um, will, uh, in, in this collaboration, very uh, difficult, different uh, collaboration, uh, will be in the pos position to produce one of the most accurate knowledge from the first uh, the, the demonstration of an asteroid deflection technology. Uh, as already stressed, uh, AIDA uh, is not a formal project uh, between NASA and ESA but is an, an agency supported collaboration, which is in my opinion, very, very important because at the end, uh, if there will be a problem, uh, a real threat coming from an asteroid, the world shall, we must collaborate. So we have to find, apart from the technology uh, demonstration themselves, apart from the science, apart from the knowledge, which is already I mean, the basis of the human being. We have also to find a new way of having the, let's say, uh, agency to work together. Um, now, very quickly, uh, maybe on the objective of DART and, uh, and ERA. Uh, DART is, as I said, NASA mission led by APL. It's a low, very uh, low cost mission. We'll be testing the, the kinetic impactor. Basically, we'll be crashing towards the, the, the Morphos uh, moon. Uh, with a speed of uh, approximately 6.6 uh, kilometers per second. We'll have, uh, as already stressed, might need a, um, a small um, CubeSat, Alicia, from the Italian Space Agency that will capture the impact of DART uh, to, uh, towards the, the moon. Uh, and also we'll, 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 um, we'll observe the ejecta cloud and all the potentially um, effect that uh, the, the, this impact will have on the on the surface of the morphos. Uh, we have also uh, um, it, uh, itself um, a camera, uh, the Drago high resolution images that uh, is suitable both for navigation and for targeting. Targeting and will will be into position of measuring the the size, the shape of the asteroids because this is also something very important. We 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 perform. Um, observation from ground, but sometimes it's not possible. So we are going towards body that we basically we do we do not know. I remember when we first see the the, the, the shape of the of the Rosetta um, target. At the end, it was like a duck, or <laughs> nobody was expecting something like this. Uh, so. Um, <coughs> Dart and ERA are important by themselves, are important for planetary science, they are important for, um, for science, they are important for knowledge, they are important for international collaboration, and they are, uh, the two of them, technology demonstration. In case of DART, uh, again, they will be demonstrating asteroid impact, advanced GNC and, and, and navigation camera, new uh, ion propulsion, new solar array, new avionics, and all, all those things, as already said by me, that will be also used uh, to introduce a new way of doing space with smaller platform, more agile, um, suitable to, 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 to carry a different signs. Now, with respect to ERA, you already saw also this mission, but very quickly, uh, ESA mission, also very low cost mission, a different way of doing mission. Uh, ERA will arrive two years later than, uh, than DART. Um, and will retrieve the physical and dynamical parameters of the dimorphos, so to validate the the, 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 the models that we have uh, for uh, for the for the impactor. We want to, to 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 see how we can deflect an asteroid in case of a real threat will come out, and so we need models, we need information, uh, we need uh, really complex technology, and those missions will really allow uh, us to to make it. Uh, Possible. Um, again, two CubeSat also NERA, Juventus and, and, and Milani now, uh, payloads, uh, a thermal infrared instrument, and a planetary altimeter to make again those missions the first uh, 
in, in many new, new fields. And then also era technology demonstration, autonomous GSMC for proximity operation, very important. New uh, image processing uh, unit, inter-satellite link, also new avionic in era. So very, very um, big step ahead when those two mission will uh, will uh, will uh, will work together now one of the the most um, let's go now on uh, what my company is doing because uh, gmv is working both on uh, an era on the mother spacecraft and on one of the two uh, cubesat uh, juventus um, we are uh, responsible for the gnc uh, development for for those uh, two spacecraft uh, in both cases, the ERA GNC uh, are one of the most complex, maybe complex and challenging subsystem of, the, of those missions. Uh, they, um, they are these, the, the GNC is basically the pilot, the, 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 the guy that brings uh, those, uh, those spacecraft to, to make their mission feasible. Uh, it will implement a set of the art autonomous vision based technology that will allow the spacecraft operation in very, very close um, uh, proximity of this binary asteroid and, uh, and, and try to, 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 to make uh, possible this characterization and, and the, 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 the testing of the efficiency of the kinetic impactor technique. Uh, the division-based um, subsystem of ERA has been uh, designed so to be operate uh, without limited and in some cases maybe no intervention from from ground. Uh, the mission uh, dynamic is is going to be very quick in certain phases. So we need a new way of of, of doing mission. Uh, as you can see here in in in, in this slide, um, the. The ERA mission will be divided in different phases, and all of them will have different objective and, and constraint. And for each of them, the a specific GNC strategy shall be defined, and also the level of autonomy needed is completely different. If you see on the on the right uh, column, you, you can see the the autonomy level. If you if you are not familiar with those E2, E1 on uh, uh, I can just tell you that E1 is a mission execution under 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 uh, ground control. So basically, is the ground that sends um, uh, the commands to to the mission, and there are limited onboard cap capability. Uh, E2 uh, is the execution of pre-planned ground-defined mission operation on board. E3 is the uh, execu execution of adaptive mission operation on board. So we enter already in a higher level of autonomy. And then E4, which is not, let's say, uh, will not be uh, for forever, at least for the moment, is what is called goal-oriented autonomy on board, meaning full autonomy, full capability of taking decision with planning and replanning capability. And you can see here, I say the, the different phases of, of, the, of the mission. So there will be a first way, phase where, um, let's say, ground will, will check the, the the operation and the separation of the, the spacecraft that everything uh, is going to work then there will be a first uh, interplanetary clues with some deep space maneuver and approach phases um, very important we enter in the characterization phase we have to be we start being very close to the spacecraft between 30 and 20 kilometer and we want in this during this phase uh, be able to conduct the, the characterization of the small moon from the physical and from the dynamical point of view. You can see on the right side the, the trajectory that uh, ERA will be following do, during those different phases. Then uh, there will be a phase where the space, the two cubes that will be released, they will be also they will also start their commissioning phase and they will prove their operational capability. Then we will enter in, in the close proximity operation up to 10 kilometers from the system by center, very complex, never done. And uh, this will allow the accurate characterization of the, the dimorphous mass, which is very, very important for the, for the accuracy of the model. In this, we enter already in, 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 in higher level of autonomy uh, because uh, the spacecraft itself has to uh, maintain certain uh, pointing characteristics and has to maintain, as we see, we will see quickly, um, uh, really heavy, uh, navigating uh, 
using the, the target as, 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 as reference. Then uh, we will go uh, down and uh, ERA will uh, approach Didymoon to fully characterize the DART impact. We will go between 20 and up to four kilometers for full payload operation. There will be really uh, high resolution images of the crater um, while also while moving, and then um, a phase where uh, there will be uh, also demonstration of very close flyby, uh, also for, for planetary defense and, and for future mission. And then there will be the dis disposal and the landing on, 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 the, on, the, on the small spacecraft. Let's now see how we do it, because it's very important to uh, as, as already mentioned, we are doing, different, depending on the phase, we are doing with different level autonomy, but we are always using, uh, we are vision based. We are using images of the system to navigate. Uh, so there will be a first phase where we will be using centroid based navigation. We, have, we need to be, uh, this is a technique, it's very important. Uh, it's very robust to, with respect to the illumination condition. You know, we are entering, um, we, we are going to, to, to watch, uh, to, to, to look at a system that we do not know exactly how it is working. There will be a rotation, there will be change, fast uh, modification within the illumination condition. We cannot allow to, we will be very fast, so we really need to be uh, safe and robust, our system. Um, but then uh, let's see how we, we really navigate on 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 uh, on, on uh, towards uh, era. You can see here in this in this video. Uh, on the right side, you will see where you are, and on the left side, you can see the system, the binary system. As I said, for the for the actual traject the, the actual strategy now is for a certain moment you will see navigating using the centroid. So you are always looking technique that always centers you with, towards the center of the, the, let's say, the main body. Even if most likely this strategy will be modified, then there will be a time that we will start, when we are closer, we will start looking at what uh, to, to feature on the surface of the, of the main body. Um, it's bigger, the, the smaller one is still is rotating, uh, so for, for, for a certain moment, you, we will follow feature on 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 the demos on, and then you will see in a certain moment that we perform some maneuver. You can see here that there will be maneuver, and then we will start navigating with the using uh, the demorphos directly. Uh, so uh, the strategy we are currently following is centroid of the system or uh, of the mother, uh, or let's say of the big asteroids feature tracking on the big asteroids and then feature tracking of on the on the small asteroid. Uh, again, very, very complex, also from a technology point of view, very, very challenging. And uh, at the same time, from an engineering point of view, I can tell you that the team, the GMB team is getting lots of fun because it's very, very interesting. Uh, now, uh, something also very important, I mean, it's a low, uh, ERA is a low-cost mission, but we want to make a successful low-cost mission. So very important, the testing on ground. From the very beginning, due to um, a lab that GMB has in, uh, in its facility, in its headquarter in Madrid, we have been testing the GNC algorithms within, in, 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 let's say, in, um, um, in closed loop using flight hardware. You can see here, this, this is a, a um, um, a, a camera that is not used anymore, we will have to perform those tests again with the new hardware. But uh, you can see here uh, the GMB team uh, working within the, the platform art um, robotic, uh, robotic labs. Um, the, 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 there, there are the mock-up of the binary, binary system on, uh, on one, one robotic arm that em emulates the, the, the motion of, of the of, of this binary system. There is a flight, uh, um, uh, um, flight model of the, of the camera and the algorithms that I was explaining you before, they are tested in closed loop because we want to, I mean, imagine we are going very, very fast within deep space and we want to catch, um, in case of DART, they want to, to impact an asteroid. In case of ERA, we want to 
navigate very, very close with something that you don't know and very high distances. So very important, all those, all those testing on, uh, on ground. And, and this basically closed my, my presentation. I, I hope I added some information to the former one. Thank you very much, uh, Mariela. Uh, so now let's move to the Q&A session. We have uh, 10 minutes uh, ahead of us, so let's try to take profit of, of them since we have all the speakers here. Um, we will start with a question maybe for Juan Luis and, um, and Michael. Uh, uh, we have a question from a delegate about uh, how do you, I'm gonna mute everyone, so like this, if you have any comments, even though if the question was not for you. Yeah, Juan Luis, I think you are unmuted. You are, okay, perfect. So uh, how do different space agencies work together in planetary defense? Is there a cooperation between ESA, NASA, JAXA, Roscosmos uh, about deflecting asteroids? And this is related with another question. Uh, imagine that you are doing your work of uh, discovering new objects you discover actually an object that is dangerous, what what do you do? What's the, the procedure in that case? Well, if, if I, might, I might start, um, the, the answer is yes. There is, uh, there is uh, now roughly 20 years of coordination that was started by United Nations uh, in, at the beginning of the century by calling up uh, what would they call the uh, action Team 14, which was discussing until 2013 what type of actions could be taken in order to, to have a, a degree of coordination between the different nations, because this is an international problem, the problem with asteroids. Mm -hmm. And um, they recommended at the end of 2013 to form two independent um, institutions or, let's say, um, groups. First one is called I1, which is the uh, International Asteroid Warning Network, which is a network of institutions, scientific institutions, space agencies, observatories, that uh, whose, whose uh, goal is to uh, actually uh, take care of the threat. So try to discover as many asteroids as possible and try to ascertain what is the threat and what would be the, the, the consequences of an impact. And this is, for example, um, our work at the NEO Coordination Center is, uh, is supporting the activities of the I1 uh, network. The second group is called the same page, which, is, uh, which stands for uh, Space Mission Advisory Planning Group, uh, Planning Advisory Group, which is uh, a group that is formed by the space agencies uh, in order to propose solutions. So whatever a threat would be, detected and, and above a given, a given threshold, and they, the, the space agencies would good, good, uh, propose uh, solutions in terms of mitigation to, uh, to, uh, to the threat. So the answer is yes, and there, there has been a lot of activities in, the, in, this, uh, in this frame, and now those two institutions are working since 2014 in order to, to address this situation. If, if Thank I, you. Oh, yeah, please. Uh, there is also an interesting conference. Uh, all the all the experts in planetary defense. We meet every two years the planetary defense conference, and uh, there are all the aspects of the let's say uh, planet um, asteroid impact treat uh, are treated. And also there is always an exercise where we try to put together all the all the potential actors to see how in case of re real treat will happen. How uh, let's say the different entities shall shall work. Together. Uh, when I say different entities, I talk about scientists, I talk about engineers, I talk about politicians, media, uh, because again, um, I mean, if something like this is going to happen, it's a, it's a world problem. It's, it's not my problem or always problem, it's a world world, and, and there shall be the, the proper way of communicating, of acting, of preparing, of doing many, many things. So it's very interesting. I advise you to to see because it's every two years, it, it, it has been now in April. And uh, I look you, I, I advise you to also to see the results of the exercise because it's always interesting. Uh, it, this is related with another question from a delegate. You, you have mentioned the actors that are working together and collaborate, but um, there's a delegate that would like to know if there's a way for an ordinary citizen or a student to help uh, in the planetary defense uh, activity. What, what would you say to, to people that it's not, let's say, involved today, but would like to help? 
Um, maybe Michael, if you want to come yeah. comment something about that. <laughs> yeah, there are, um, there are various, various aspects where you can try to answer this question. One is, of course, to if you are interested to go into engineering and you know, into science and planetary science, to be able to work in the field and to, to help in the field. Another way is in your environment to, to spread awareness, to make sure that there is a consciousness about the, about, the, about the potential asteroid threat, which is something that we may have missed a little, a little bit in the past, maybe about the threat of a pandemic, so that the that the awareness is there and then that is also the public support is there to to support this field. Yes, actually, if I might also add, uh, there are lots of, of amateur astronomers that are uh, supporting activities in asteroid research and uh, they are they are extremely helpful in uh, adding um, astrometric measurements of asteroids, so the positions of the asteroid in the sky and also in determining properties, for example, rotation state of asteroids by means of light curves or, or other types of, uh, of um, uh, properties. So there is, if you, if people is, is interested and motivated about uh, participating in astronomical, on the astronomy side of it, there are really lots of, of things that can be, done by, can be done by amateur astronomers and people that are interested about this. Uh, thank you. Uh, I hope this will help to delegates uh, that want to help somehow. Uh, Mehdi, we have a question for you uh, related to CubeSat, since you mentioned them in your presentation. Um, how would the future of commercialization of CubeSats for deep space missions uh, look like? What, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, I think for the moment, most of the, of the <coughs> contracts are an institutional. Uh, so the deep space uh, missions are being contracted by governments and institutions. Um, a couple of years ago, there were, uh, I would say, an economic bubble um, on the asteroid mining, uh, where many companies were looking at, at that possibility. Uh, since then, it has been a, a bit uh, stopped uh, because most of the companies uh, changed uh, targets for in terms of uh, of, of business case. Uh, but I think they, they, there is still a lot of progress to 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 be made before we can uh, develop a, a proper business case for that. Um, but we start to see also. Uh, um, CubeSat to, uh, to to Mars with the, the, the Marco from, from, from NASA and uh, to the moon with Argo Moon. Um, so there are potential for also a, a moon missions that could support, uh, let's say, the, the communication or the, the mapping or, or, or things like this. So there they are potential, but we still have a lot to, to, to do before we have a, a, a sustainable uh, economic uh, business case. Okay. Uh, now we have a, an interesting question, I think it's for, for, for everyone, about all those films and movies that talked about post-apocalyptic uh, scenarios where we are all going to, to die, uh, do you think that science fiction uh, help or uh, hinder space science development and communication? Is that for you a good communication or you consider it is not doing the, the right uh, job? What's your opinion on that? <laughs> I think it is helpful in the sense there has been a move between, I don't know, 19, the 1990s and today, that the possibility of an asteroid impact is seen as something, well, which is not likely to happen in the near future, but as something real and not, not a joke. And to some extent, the movies that were at the time, like, like Deep Impact and Armageddon, may have, may have helped to, the, may, may have helped to, to this change in mood. So I think overall it was helpful or it is, it can be helpful. Okay. Did you want to add something, Mariela or Juan Luis about oh, that? It's funny because every time I, I somebody, I mean, I guess in interview, there is always this question and especially everybody's mentioning about Armageddon. So I agree with Mike. I mean, you know, uh, one of the important things of, of, of planetary de defense is first to be aware of the problem. And uh, the knowledge, because um, the I also saw a, a question asking if big vehicle could help. The, could help. the reality of uh, of the planetary defense is that we need to know uh, if there is a threat, 
and when and, and and we need to know this in advance because if we know this in, in advance we not we do not need big vehicle what we have to do i mean if, if you know uh, michael showed a, a, a graph I mean, if, you, if, if if we will be in the, in the position of uh, deflecting a sm small um, impact in an asteroid many some years uh, before then we can maybe uh, deflect this in, in advance without needing big, big. So, um, in my opinion, the, the, the science movies, they help. I mean, if you see somebody like uh, running on a, an asteroid, maybe this can, can be confused for, <laughs> for people that <laughs> do not know. So, but uh, it's very important, as Michael was stressing, that we are aware of the problem uh, overall. Because I mean the problem is complex and and uh, and, um... <laughs> and let's let's thank you Mariela. Let's finish just with the last questions because we are uh, arriving to the end. Um, we have been uh, we have observed no the the plot with all the discovered uh, neos objects uh, so far and with the size of the of the objects that have been discovered and the ones that have not been discovered. Could we say that we have already or we are very close to track all the dangerous objects for, for us? Uh, no, unfortunately not. Um, okay, what we can say for more or less for sure is that we have been able to almost completely uh, discover and track the, the very big ones, the ones that are above one kilometer and uh, that the level of completion is very high so we can be more or less certain that we are safe there. But uh, we have seen the example of, of Chelyabinsk. Just with a 20 meter object, you can already create a lot of damage. And if we go to the 100 meter size, it would be a disaster for a, for a very big region. So, and there we still have a, a lot of objects to discover. So we still have a lot of work to, to, to do in order to, uh, to successfully achieve uh, some confidence that we will not ha be having a problem in the, in the midterm. And for this, I might, I might also add that uh, the Fly-Eye Telescope will be helping, the Vera Rubin Telescope will be helping a lot, and NASA's mission, um, uh, any survey mission, will be also helping a lot in, in let's say, closing the gap in, in discovering all, all these objects. Thank you, Juan Luis. Uh, does someone want to add something else just to finish? Uh, okay, so I think it's, let's uh, remain with this last message, uh, the importance of all the activities that you are conducting. Um, we are not totally safe yet, and it's important to, to support all those developments and all those missions. So thank you very much, uh, Juan Luis, uh, Mariela, Mehdi, and Michael. I hope you enjoy, and, um, and see you ne next time. Thank you. thank you, Ivan. Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Thank <laughs> you.